how to make the most out of your November. We're sharing some of the best advice we have heard here on the Exodus podcast and some things that we've learned. And we want to share this to you so you can make the most out of this November. We're sharing tips from people like Don Higgins, John Eberhardt, Tanner and Jared from Whitetail Adrenaline and so many other folks. So you can make the most out of right now and have your best season. All right, it is. Woo, it's the time we've been waiting for. And we're bringing in the big guns. We're bringing in the biggest artillery we have in the archive possible to make this your best November ever. What do you think about that? I think it is going to be the best November ever for a whole lot of folks. Not just because of this episode, just because it's it's November, it's 2023. We all advance and get better each and every year. And dude, I'm just like on the edge I'm, I'm on the edge of excitement right now. I'm like, you know me, a little bit stoic, a yeah. little bit a non-emotional guy, but I'm on the edge of my seat ready to start doing jumping jacks, man. I'm, I'm, let's go. Yeah, I, I just lose mental clarity. I can't think anything other than deer this time of year. It's just, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's like sitting at my desk and it's like, I have a real, usually I'm pretty focused and, and here's my checklist is boom. I can't do it this time of year, man. It's like, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. So I'm thankful. I'm very thankful that we can slate this as part of uh, the job here and talk about all this because it's already on top of my mind. It is a perk, man. It is a perk. Yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to share basically when the most amount of bucks are getting killed. I mean, we're looking, I know late October is, is excellent for someone that has a very refined plan. Maybe they have history. Maybe they have a really good mousetrap built. But for the most of us out there on the face of the earth, November's when, when you, you, know, you cut the hay or, or it rains on your hay and then you're screwed. So now we're trying to make the weather cooperate <laughs> for you. Um, and so we're bringing in guys like Don Higgins, Bill Winky, Steve Hansen, Jared Scheffler, Tony Peterson, Johnny Eberhardt, Steve Shirk, just the gambit of no matter where you're at in this country, no matter what your style is, whether you have public, public or private, whether you're aggressive or more passive, we're bringing in a slew of very topical, great advice. How many, how many giant deer out of those list of people I just mentioned, how many giant deer have died because of those guys? Oh, Ooh. my gosh. It's probably over 400. It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, it's just crazy. So basically what we're saying is we can give you our advice, but these guys are, um, they're, they're better deer hunters than us. So I think they have the track record to prove it. So that's why we're bringing in the experts and we're not trying to put on an expert hat, but we do that's, know a thing. That's right. Um, well, here, here's the other cool thing. Like each one of those guys you mentioned kind of has a different system, absolutely. different method to their madness. So like not just regionally are their styles a little bit different, but like the individual person, their attitude, their personality, uh, their methods of the madness is all a little bit different. So there's a lot of little tidbits to gather from uh, from this episode, regardless of your region or your style, man. So it, it's, it's going to be a banger. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we can get right into it. We can get it right into November 1st through the 5th. This is the, kind of the first leg of November. And um, we have a couple people to draw on. The first one, Steve Hansen. And so we had this conversation earlier this summer when I was out there scouting for my now Iowa tag. And, uh, he is still aggressively calling in the first part of November. And there's some clips that we've done in the past where basically smash those suckers together. Don't be, don't tickle them. And here's the interesting thing too, because I know there's guys um, like Rod White. We actually had him on here. He's rattled in a bunch of bucks. So like, once again, different ways to find success. His idea is more just rattle them just to where you can hear them, which is a little bit more situational because he can see them. But there was a study with uh, – on the Texas ranch down there and they did a study on rattling and they found that smashing them together as loud as you can works substantially better than more passive calling. So take that for what it's worth. If you're blind calling, especially any specific advice um, for early November that you think or what you have seen to be mo in a most of effective strategy for you know, shooting mature bucks too. Not, yeah. For right. Yeah. For, for hunting and, and, you know, harvesting mature bucks. I mean, the biggest one in that early November time is to recognize when scrapes are no longer important. I think a lot of people hunt scrapes longer into November uh -huh. than they really should. And then that first two, you know, November 2nd, 3rd, 4th, something in there, rattling is still highly effective. Mm -hmm. I would I would recommend that. You know, I'd say when they stop really hitting the scrapes, you probably still, rattling still going to be effective for three or four days. You know, it seems like they're still on that before they go into full chase mode. So, so, and so break down what a setup would look like for that for the November 2nd, 
third or fourth with rattling it uh, morning evening are you set up let's let's break down the morning then let's break down an evening okay set. so in the morning what does that look like yeah like in the morning you know you're going to be more likely in the timber either you know really close to where you know they're bedding you know obviously downwind of it or in some type of a funnel leading to it and if you're going to employ rattling as part of that strategy try to hunt a stand or have a stand that has a significant terrain advantage, you know, something that they can't get downwind yeah, like, of you. Like that pond. The, the pond. Like or that those pond. Big set, yep, exactly. You know, having a setup like that's going to be a strong, you know, a strong rattling setup. That's what you want to look for where they can't get downwind of you and 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 pick you off. So mm -hmm. that would be the, you know, the most important. Um and are you rattling at hour after uh, sunrise or are you wait until like eight or nine o'clock no, in the morning? No, my, my strategy has always been different on rattling like that. As soon as it's light enough that you can glass around and make sure there's nothing close enough to pick off your movement, I, that's when I would rattle. That's when everything in the woods can hear, everything mm -hmm. in the woods knows, you know, that's when they're they're the most attuned to their environment. The wind hasn't usually picked up by then. It's cooler yet. Mm -hmm. I would recommend, you know, a strong rattling sequence right at first light. Then I'd probably let the morning play out. And then maybe, you know, two other sets throughout the morning, an hour, hour and a half apart. How so, long of a sequence do you not suggest? Not typically very long, five to 10 seconds, uh -huh. you know, Just something. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then stop and then a little bit and then put them away. Uh -huh. So. That's uh, and then that would lead to another thing. You know, we've had a lot of people. You try to coach someone on this if they haven't seen it work, and most people from other places haven't. I've never had six. Right. I've never. I think I've never. I mean, I've rattled in like three year olds. Sure. I've never rattled in a mature. Bike. Right, and that's what you know. A lot of people do that. Then they're standing there, still have their antlers in their hand. Put those and all the up. yeah. Put them up and be ready. Not you don't have to clip your release on, but you want to be ready because you know they have an uncanny ability of knowing exactly where that sound came from yeah. and they can be at 15 yards and they're looking for you. You won't be able to do much at that point because you're, pinned and, you're like, pinned and then you've missed your opportunity. Okay. So. That's a, so rattle, grab your bow. Yep. Grab your bow, at least be ready so that, you know, you're not, you don't have to, you know, get something out of your pack or, uh -huh. you know, hang people always just don't have a place to hang their antlers yep. and that's the other thing i if you're going to employ rattling i'd put an extra bow hook in yep. so when you rattle you can hang them up kind of quickly they're right there they're not in your way and and just be ready to go okay so that second third fourth and then for the evening hunts i assume are you downwind of a uh, primary food source yeah you know that that's kind of the time time of year when we transition away from food plots but those days there we st still probably would be field edge or close to field edge hunting on the you know, on or close to the food sources. So up next we have Dan in fall. I've had actually had the pleasure to hunt with Dan on more than one occasion, not during the rut, but you know, during the early parts or the earlier parts of September and kind of the middle October kind of time frame. But the interesting thing is I've been following Dan for a long time. Um, even going back to the pre Exodus days on the hunting beast and learning about the betting kind of hierarchy or the structure and how different bucks will kind of adjust their betting for different times of the year based on what they're trying to accomplish. And, you know, obviously during the first week of November, through all through November, they're using all of their senses to cover as much ground as possible to find those does, right? So it's no different than us using cameras and binos and vehicles and, you know, scouting to cover ground to find target bucks. They're finding their target does. And one of the things that he mentions in November is that betting shift, um, that he calls rut bedding, right? So it's like a temporary bed where bucks can get downwind of these doe bedding areas and essentially just check on them or monitor them kind of in a 24 seven or what you would consider 24 seven status while they're in their bed. So um, let's, yeah, let's just dive in. Let's see what Dan has to say about hunting buck bedding adjacent to doe bedding or rut beds. Most of the, um mature bucks I shoot during uh, rut are coming off of uh, buck bedding areas that are adjacent to doe bedding areas. They seem to hole up in them. Uh, and that's something I came into just not too long ago, like uh, in the last four or five years, as I started learning that bucks have specific, uh, uh, mature bucks have specific rut beds where they're not running around with those other bucks like crazy chasing. That's not to say they don't get up and wander too. I mean, yeah. you could look at uh, telemetry and, and see that, but you also see that they lock up in spots. And what I'm finding is you find these bedding areas that uh, there ain't much of a bed and you can hardly see it, but all the trees around it are rubbed and they're like tore up like crazy. So you know that that buck spent a short time period bedding there, but was very agitated to rub all those trees. And then I'm finding that those spots are generally looking at the, op uh, like the exit 
from a doe bedding area, or they're just downwind of it. And we started hunting those. We've been having a lot of action watching those bucks. They're holing up next to those does because, like we know, those mature bucks don't want to wander around in daylight, but they still want to be in on the breeding. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're guarding their does from the younger bucks. Roughly, what are some dates for the Midwest to where you have been seeing them spend the, the most time in those rut beds? Uh, for me, it's been um, probably that last week of October, first week of November. Um, and you get into the second week of November, they, they get a little bit more, uh, it still works, but they get a little more uh, unpredictable. Where they're predictable and uh, still sticking to patterns pretty much in that early rut. I have to ask, what was your hunting beast username? Do you remember? I, I don't remember. I haven't been on. I, now, I, <laughs> now I feel guilty because I literally have not been on there probably since 2015. Okay. 2016. Uh, I didn't it was know. probably it something be... really gay, dude, honestly. Yeah. Rodeo <laughs> book hunter. <laughs> it, pro- it, it was probably something like going 90 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, so now we have Jason Michael. Jason is an awesome individual. Uh, one of the one of the people you run across in this line of work that you're just thankful you got to meet and uh, <clears throat> contagious positive personality. And he's breaking down what I like about Jason. He's hunted all across the Midwest on every type of farm you can imagine. And he's talking about the importance of setting up on doe bedding in mornings. Here's what he specifically has to share about that. Absolutely. When, when are you finding your most success? <clears throat> For the last 20 years, if I had to throw one day out of the, of the, of the whole three-month window, if you wanted to use October, November, and December as a, an example, uh, Iowa was a perfect example one time. November 4th, November 4th, and November 4th. Morning, morning, and morning. And that's just maybe because I was back in the bedding, and November 4th is an extremely strong pre-rut day. It might be getting to where it's just about to come off of it. Fifth and sixth will pretty much start turning into full blown by the eighth, ninth, tenth, for the most part, for sure. And uh, yeah, that for for the last twenty years. I mean, I say the last twenty years. Uh, that would be my window, a pre rut or a rut. Dude, I love Jason. He, he could be one of my favorite people that I have met through through Exodus. Um, and we don't need to go into that story, but just an upbeat, positive guy, down to earth, salt of the earth type of dude. Um, and he lives and breeds whitetails. Like he hunts a bunch, like does his turkey stuff, does his, you know, other big game stuff prior to whitetail season. But that dude is more, he's probably the most passionate person when it comes to like the travel style hunting and just like, that's what he lives for, man. He's and he's been doing it for a long time before it was even he a, was, a thing. Yeah. He was doing, he was doing the travel stuff before the travel stuff was cool for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He, and he, it's funny because the day of the Iowa draw, he was the first person to say, I hope you drew your tag. I hope you have the best hunt ever. Good luck. Like, He's know, just a good dude. Yeah. Cause I mean, to take the time out of your day and go do that is, uh, you know, appreciated. And so that's just the type of dude that he is. So yeah. that's what he has to say about that time frame, especially be, between November 1st and the 5th. Now we're getting to the next chunk of November. It's the 6th through the 11th, which. You know, there's a few dates in there that statistically you got to be in a tree. And uh, there's a lot of different theories during this time period. But regardless, there's a bunch of deer getting killed right now. And I think what hopefully out of this little chunk here, you're going to be slightly more refined. So you're not wasting any of those days and you're making the absolute most of it. And uh, even dating this back to when we did the white tail cribs with Bill Winky and we recorded an episode and this was one of November 7th was seventh and eighth is one of his favorite days for, to kill a solid buck. Now I watched and consumed quite a bit of his stuff. And now that time frame has kind of shifted to late October, like we've talked about, but this is still an excellent time. So w- real quick though, six to the 11th, what, what is your just quick, quick plans? My it's quick here, plans? Well, mentally like jump in the time machine here. Like where are you going to be? Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm probably shifting to some kind of travel funnels at at that point in time. But when I say travel funnels, Andy May and I have talked about this. I think sometimes guys get pinned down into, you know, pinch points and and funnels and there's nothing wrong with that. But another thing to be thinking about is, you know, exit trails or, or a series of trails coming out or into one particular area, typically around those, uh, around those rut funnels, maybe in between bedding areas. 
but not to set up on a specific trail, but set up to a point where, you know, bucks are going to cross them perpendicularly because they want to cross again. They were just covering ground using their nose. And if they can cover five or six trails perpendicularly, like, you know, coming a cutting across those trails, basically more than likely they're going to do that more than traveling one trail and going up the next trail and coming down the next trail. They just want to cover ground as much as possible. Use their eyes, use their nose again, use all of their senses to, to do that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think there's, <clears throat> we'll get into some, some specific uh, tactics here, but that's a great piece of advice. Cause I, if you, which I'm just pulling this out of, out of my rear here, but if you, I assume if you look at the GPS collar data on the amount of daylight movement of bucks that were collared, I mean, this is, has to be probably peak movement in terms of during the season. So there's a much larger um, margin of air as a hunter, the deer's mm-hmm. going to be on the feet more longer and, and cover more distance. So it's a great place just to be out there in your best spot. So as long as you didn't burn those out earlier in the year. So, and even if you did, get in there anyways it doesn't really matter like <laughs> if, if, if you still have the vibe uh i wouldn't i would forget all the other hunts where you you got winded by a doe or a, a, a forky picked you out of your tree forget all of it just go back yeah. in there yeah the, the one thing i would add to that is like don't lose don't lose this thought in your mind about ingress and egress like your exit and entries because i think you still have to be careful with I agree. Say, can yeah. you get away with more absolutely but you don't want to be walking where you anticipate deer 100%. to be to be on to be on yeah. you. Like you just shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, especially because you have to imagine. All right, so this is the scenario that a lot of people see. It's the doe that comes in and the bucks back a hundred yards away. You have to fool the doe, and the doe is still thinking with its right mind. And an old mature doe is hard to trick. So like you can't forget the basics and just say, "I have a horseshoe in my pocket. It's November seventh and eighth. Nothing <laughs> matters." It still matters. You still have to be methodical, but just know you have an X factor of luck. That's it. That's but it. But you still have uh, success and skill tied together. So, all right. So, Steve Hansen, he is going to share a very specific thing. It might be a little bit different than what you're thinking. I'm not going to. I'm not going to um, spoil it for you. So, let's go ahead and hear what Steve has to say, especially during this time period. Um, what's going to happen is once you get a, you know, into that fifth, six, something in there. Once they really start chasing, those does do not want to go to the food plots. They are going to they're going to get harassed, and that's not the time to be sitting on the on the field edge. So it's important to try to pay attention to what phase the ruts in. a good lot of open shooting lanes that's so. a piece of advice i think a lot of people have probably cost themselves opportunity where they yes. picked the right spot but it wasn't trimmed out it wasn't enough. trimmed yeah. out well enough where they were overly overly worried about cover and and not shooting at that time of year i would worry more about the ability to shoot less about the cover okay so yeah that's good advice i think where uh, steve hunts hunts in iowa so it might be a slightly different than where you're at um in the country but if you are hunting something even somewhat similar i think the principles are are fair and, and the premise there is the does are getting harassed on food and so maybe they're not wanting to go to the major food source and have a three-year-old or two-year-old buck just chase them all around that's just it man i i have seen that in person with my own two eyes um you know scouting at that point in time in that season like specifically out on the road in kansas or missouri where does are in the nastiest thickest spots you would not expect deer to be 
because they are being pestered day in and day out. And like, they're just like, to your point, tired of being harassed. So they're trying to visually uh, just get away from their normal bedding areas and, and, and hide. I've seen that with my own two eyes on a handful of occasions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. However, I mean, there could be some scenarios where I always think too, if you, if you got a picture of a deer or you had an encounter with one earlier in the morning um, or you see one midday, it's not a bad idea to be on that food source later that evening, the closest food source. I mean, it just make it really simple. Where was he at? Where's the closest food source? Is he going to be there? And there's a chance that he will be. So that's probably my highest bet if you're in that situation, especially during this time frame. All right. So next we have, this is actually fun because a lot of these things, I mean, the Exodus podcast has been around for over 300 episodes, I think since 2018. So like we've been doing this for five years now. Yeah. And so back then, like this, especially some of these clips with Don Higgins before they had a podcast and before he had been on a bunch of podcasts, like a lot of this, whether people will admit it, and maybe I'm taking more credit than what we deserve. A lot of these principles that are just second nature now. Transpired right here, brother. A little, a little investigative journalism here. All right. We brought the information and now uh, it is all in your subconscious. So, uh, this is another clip of that. The other thing I noticed that I wrote about in 2015, that the title of the uh, article was Homecoming Bucks. And uh, what I noticed is that these bucks that, that shift their range in the fall, they have a, summer, a, a definite summer range, and then they have a different fall-winter range. And what I noticed is that these bucks uh, that, that shift their range at the very beginning of the rut, they will a lot of times make a journey back to where they summered or at the very tail end of the rut, they'll make a journey back to where they summered. And my theory is that these bucks relocate early in the fall. They've got their home range. They stay there. As the rut starts to heat up, they can't find a hot dough at home. And they're really anxious to get that first hot dough. So they, they get so anxious, they run back home to where they spent the summer and they look for it there. I mean, I've got example after example and i was showing some of those in my seminar that i did here earlier today that uh the these bucks are it's around say november 5th to about the 7th or so right before them does are coming in heat i see these bucks these mature bucks that have relocated run back to where they spent their summer and then right at the very the last three or four days of november the first two or three days of december they'll do the same thing sometimes the same buckle <laughs> will do both a lot of times I don't catch them uh, both doing it early and late, and I think a lot of it is just tied to whether they can find a hot dough at home or not. If they can, they stay there, but uh, if not, they run back to where they spent their summer. You've made mention in the past between the 5th and the 12th is arguably here in the Midwest, we're in Illinois, peak activity for bucks. Daylight activity, would you agree or disagree? Th- that seven-day period is probably the period where you're going to see the most buck activity. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to narrow it down to mature bucks, you know, when you start getting to the end of that period, you know, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, a lot of those mature bucks are going to be locked down with does, and they're going to be really tough. Early in that period it is going to be fantastic for those bigger bucks. You know, more booners are killed November 7th and 8th than any other dates. So, uh, and, and the reason for it is they're, the does, for the most part, aren't quite in heat yet and the bucks have worked themselves into a fever pitch, they're covering some territory trying to find that first doe in heat. And once they find her, they become a whole lot more difficult to kill. Mm-hmm. But if you can find him when he's still on that search, um, you got I mean, he's on his feet more, and he's on his feet more in daylight. So it just increases your odds of success. What is the best day in the month of November to kill a giant buck? If I had to boil it down to one day without a doubt, it would be November 7th. I mean, Don's such an incredible whitetail hunter. Like when you think of the the grand scheme of things and everybody where they are in their journey with kind of the, the uh, household names per se, Don is just completely on another level targeting individual, very specific bucks. And he has his plan laid out years in That's advance. Crazy. It is yeah. the amount of work in detail that he puts in to killing a specific deer I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's relatively unmatched. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple guys out there that we don't know sure. that are going through that same process, but there's not very many people in the United States doing what Don does. And it's just, you know, his portfolio, you know, his track record over the last handful of years um, speaks for itself. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's just phenomenal. 
It really is. And actually, we're recording this on October 26th before I head to Iowa. Last night, he actually shot his number one buck. There you go. <laughs> and and that's another thing, too. It seems like uh, some of these last really big deer he shot have been in the later part of October when it used to be this time frame of November. So I'm going to back up a little bit. I talked to Don um, last week. It was the beginning of last week. And he had seen that deer the day before. And when he seen him, I can't remember the exact situation, but the deer was moving away from him. And his exact words were, I'll kill him in the next, in, in the next two sits. That's what he said. So there you there go. You go. <laughs> there you go. Call your shot. Can you just imagine? Um, obviously, it's one of those deals where you can't fake 40 years of experience. Can you just imagine, you know, 40 years from now, 30 years from now, when you have that much conviction of just, it's, it's almost matter of fact. It's not like what if or I hope. It's just, yeah. It's, yeah. His days are numbered. Like, it's yeah. that simple. <laughs> it's that simple with the utmost calmness of just, I would not want to be a big deer in any of the areas Don can hunt. I just, it's, yeah, your days are numbered. It's going to end with an arrow in your lungs. <laughs> For sure. All right, so this is um, rolling into Ryan Springer. Ryan, Ryan's a very fun guy, another person that I'm uh, privileged to have met through Exodus. And he he's, um, you know, like, I think a lot of people get these perceptions of you're just a rut hunter, you kill a lot of three and four-year-olds. That's kind of what, what people's short-circuited brain comes to. Like, oh, you yeah. killed a nice deer on the 7th or 8th, probably was a 3 or 4 year old. Yeah, they I mean, discount it. Exactly. And, but Ryan Springer likes hunting the rut, and he has some very specific tactics. And he kills really big, mature deer during this time period, too. So that's why we brought this clip in, because don't discount this. There's opportunity if you're trying to target a mature buck. They're still ready, and they're still running around, and there's still that margin of bears increase. So here is what he has to say. It might not be groundbreaking, but it's what you need to hear. Uh, bottom line is I'm going to treat daylight to dark. You, you have to put the time in. It's, it's a matter of probability, right? Being, in, being able to hunt more hours of the day just gets you more opportunity, right? Now, where to go and, you know, where are you going to spend that day? You know, all those things come up, you know, and we can discuss those. But generally speaking, hunt as many hours as you can. You know, when you have the opportunity sit in a tree and eat, do your business, you do what you got to do up there. You know, yeah. um, definitely don't go to the truck. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> you know, it never fails, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm not going to take that chance. It's not worth it to me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just going to stay in a tree. Where are you switching stands midday at all? Or are you just, you're posted up in a, in a, in a pinch all day, you know, playing the right. odds. Yeah. When, when I'm, when I'm trying to focus on, let's say, you know, the peak of the rut, right. Because that's what this conversation's about. I'm going to be hunting close to a doe group, the zone in my mind right now that I'm thinking, I know that the deer bed within 150 yards of me, you know, there's a good bedding area on a South facing slope. It's covered in, you know, bush honeysuckle or mortar floor rows, or, you know, it's just thick and nasty. The deer go up in there. I don't ever go up in there. Right. And I'm just on the, on the West facing slope around the corner of it, you know, just kind of waiting on them. Um, they, they have a tendency to travel uh, from that zone. Uh, down a little ridge, you know what I mean? That comes essentially right past where, where I'm set up. So I'm just going to spend the time in there. You know, those deer are constantly moving, um, checking these doe groups, you know, throughout the day. So I'm just going to stay there. I'm on a, I'm on a great access point, a pinch, you know, and a, a lot of it too is knowing your land, you know, it's, you can go into a new zone and get an idea, you know, and start seeing a sign and kind of reading it. But over the years, kind of honing in on really, you know, really understanding how the property works, it makes a world of difference. It really does. So, and then are in the evening, are you still posted up in that pitch point? Are you trying to re relocate to a food source or uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that? Right. Uh, generally, as long as I'm close to the direction of travel that I think the does are going to go that evening, right, I'm going to stay put. Okay. Um, if they, you know, if they're going to turn and go a different way, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be opposed to picking up and moving. Um, some of the spots I hunt, you know, I'll, I'll know where the doe groups come through in the morning. I mean, there's one ridge, you know, they'll, they'll feed on the acorns. So they'll, they'll come right up the ridge, go to bed, but then sometimes in the evenings, they'll go another way, you know, out towards a cornfield access. That's where I may slip around, you know, and, and hunt a spot like that. Um, if I'm in a spot that I think they're going to come right back through, I'm just sitting tight. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of just using the doe group as, uh, live decoy or live, live bait in some form or fashion. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's what they're after. That's what I'm after, you know, <laughs> stick with the does, you know, that's, that's what I want to see when I'm getting pictures of, of does all summer, 
in my spots and no bucks, I'm okay with that. In fact, that's the spot I like, right? Because I've got the does. This zone is the doe group, you know, and the bucks will come. So that's, you know, I'm okay with that. I really do focus on the does. So there it is, November 6th through the 11th. Awesome, awesome time. And some of my favorite, like the 10th is an awesome day. The 11th is the awesome day. And uh, obviously the 7th, like it's just, it, it, it's a, when you hunt dark to dark during the 6th through 11th, it kind of feels like a long time. But when it's over, it's like, wow, that went, that went super fast. Yeah, I was going to make the same exact point. It's like November 10th, November 11th. You're getting to the point where, Maybe you've hunted a stretch. Of fatigue is a factor. <laughs> yeah. It starts the yeah, the fatigue, the mental fatigue starts to creep in. And this is like this is when your attitude has to be on point. This is when yep. you have to stay disciplined. This is when the core circle of guys around you can make a difference, man. Agreed. Yeah. And that's so, so important because you know, positivity can be contagious and pessimism can be uh, contagious. And so you gotta be surrounded by people that are, hey dude, uh, yesterday sucked. But tomorrow's yeah. gonna be better. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah, and be that guy for somebody else, man. Absolutely. Like, like the text that you you mentioned from Jason Michael, like be that person for somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the challenge right here. Text text three of your hunting friends and say, "Hey, dude, today's your day. Go out there and get it. Seize the day. Make it happen. If not, learn something." So now we're rolling into a little bit more funky time of year, and this is gonna be a lot more state dependent. I feel as gun seasons are starting to creep on the tail end of this. But the November 12th through the 17th, it's very interesting because, like I said, it's the end of October has gained a lot more popularity in the last three years, in, in my mind, just based off of talking with people. The next most popular time frame is right here and maybe the back end of this leading into the next section that we're going to talk about. But um, what's what's your opinion on November 12th to the 17th? It's tough, man. Um, I've only... I think I killed that Kansas deer on November 12th, but outside of that, I've really had a hard time kind of with this time frame. Um, one, you start to get wore down a little bit, but I think at this point, a lot of bucks are with does and like, it's, it's difficult. My approach has kind of changed over the last handful of years. I can go back five or six years and I'm still hunting doe bedding at this time. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one specific hunt. I'm sitting in a doe bedding area and I'm watching does come back to bed in the morning. And I sat there dark to dark. I think it was two or three days it, during this time frame and did not see a single buck, man. And like mm. that just like it, that, hard. that, that killed me. Uh, I mm -hmm. can remember like emotionally that killed me. But I think my opinion, again, has shifted to a lot of what these gentlemen are, are about to speak on is covering ground. And that's what I did in Kansas and found some success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is with Rod White. He's it's fun getting new guys on the on the Exodus podcast. And so that was the first time I ever spoke with him was uh, earlier in October. And he absolutely loves specifically the let's say the 15th, 16th, 17th of this time frame, and then a little bit back on on this. So this is his strategy to specifically target bucks, especially on public land. And I know he's an Iowa resident and people are like, yeah, he's in Iowa, but he's killed big deer on public in Illinois, Missouri, Kansas. So if you're in one of those states, and then even Specifically, like these principles may not work amazing if you're in Pennsylvania or Michigan, but they're still going to work in some capacity based off of Rod's words. So not mine. <laughs> so let's get into what Rod has to say. Where does November 14th, uh, just say the end of the month, rank in your favorite times to chase whitetails? It's number one by far. Um, from from about the 14th, <clears throat> really, at like the, the 11th through the 13th are the ones I, those are the days I like, I, I don't even, almost don't bother. I still go out, but almost i don't think i've ever connected with a buck in those days I'm not to say obviously couldn't what, what but do you from, think that's just that's peak lockdown i call during that period yeah and, and by lockdown like i hate that name because it's a little bit of a misnomer I, I, you've just got your mature bucks most of your does are in heat and the the, the bucks that are are going to be mating with the does are doing that right then and they're just not moving far generally speaking unless they get bumped in my opinion in my experience um but what i do watch a lot uh, at that time of year is when you do see a buck with a doe they're, they're moving so slow and there's been times where you know man I, i'll watch maybe cover 100 yards and i sit there all day long looking at those things um and you just you know some cases depending on the terrain and stuff you may not be able to do anything about it so um that's a that's the roughest period for me but as soon as that breaks loose and it's usually around the 14th um from then until thanksgiving day if if you don't have gun pressure in your state um those are in my opinion the best day to shoot a giant whitetail especially if you're a public land hunter or you're a person that maybe you have limited access to land um, to where like you, you can't target a buck, like 
I know a lot of people watch juries and, and those guys that own large tracks. And I used to manage, you know, 3000 plus acre tracks. So, um, it, it, it is a very frustrating time of the year for those people. But for those of us that are, have, don't have a target buck nailed, it's a great time because those bucks are, it, I, I, I liken it to this. It's like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's closing time at the bar. <laughs> and so most of those bucks have, have gotten, you know, there, there were, there were lots of ladies. And now there's only like a couple ladies. And so those guys that are all lined up at the bar right there, they're going to start moving from bar to bar, trying to find some others if they haven't in that last hour or so. Um, and that's kind of what you got going on in those six to seven days, in my opinion, is you've got, or maybe it's a little bit more than that. You've got time to capitalize on those deer that are moving large distances, but it's also a time where you really have to be a good woodsman and understand terrain. You have to understand uh, funnels. You have to understand what bedding and transition areas look like, because they're going to be going basically from bedding area to bedding area, uh, looking for does. So every place that they've known in their heads that there were does before, like a local bar, they're going mm-hmm. to those local bars, um, trying to pick up on one. So, and you know, that's what, uh, um, you know, I, my little saying, I guess I tell everybody is tenacity kills. And so it's the toughest time of the year because you're going to see less deer, like a lot less deer, but your mature bucks are going to be up and on their feet. So you're, you're really, if, if you're chart targeting an ultra mature buck and, I, and when I say mature, I'm I, in my opinion, a mature buck is five. And what about, and what older. do you think about midday movement during this time period as well? That's when I kill probably 90% of the animals. And midday to you um, is like 10 to 2? Yeah, uh, up to maybe okay. 233. Um, that, around that two, two to three hour mark, somewhere in there, I'm going to get down and move to another spot. If I've been sitting in the same stand all day. Um, I don't generally like to get out until around 2. I, I think the biggest thing that I see, besides the cell phone thing, <laughs> is uh, um, the unwillingness to do something different. They want to go back to the same stands they've been hunting the whole season um, or where they saw a big buck at. Uh, it just – things are very dynamic that time of year, um, and, it, and especially if you're in a state with guns. There's a lot less deer on the landscape too. you got to you know remember, most people shoot their deer that last week of October, True. first week of November. So a lot of bucks are gone that were normally gone. That's part of the reason why you see decreased movement. It's not really necessarily decreased. It's, there's mm-hmm. a lot less deer out there. Um, you know, I know – most of my buddies here in Iowa, they, they kill deer every year. So I mean, you start looking at, you know, if I have a circle of friends of say 20, 25 guys that I know of, I, I would say 90% of them have killed their deer by November yeah. 15th. So, um, those are 15 deer that are gone out of the yes. pool too. So that's, that's something to kind of consider a little bit, but I, I feel like, you know, if, if you, if you're going in a new state, like going back to that scenario, you do your e-scouting, you gather whatever you can from social media, you call your friends, uh, other people that have had tags in the area if possible. Um, and then, then you go put your boots on the ground. And that's, to me, that's this time, that time of the year, this time of year coming up here, that 14th to Thanksgiving, you've just got to put your time in. Um, and that's the one thing that I, I would say more than anything else. And I know nobody likes to hear it as a regular job, but you know, I've been fortunate. And this is the first year I, I'm not going to be able to hunt the entire season. Um, so I'm kind of in their shoes, <laughs> but Man, it's just time. Yeah, you know the overlooked the overlooked areas. Um, might be something like really basic and simple, but it, I, I feel like critically thinking, it's something that still plays a part in this time frame. And you know, going back to the point where a buck is going to push a doe kind of out of the way to kind of isolate her, whether that's against a river or in a little patch of a thicket out in the middle of a, a field where there's a drainage ditch or something of that nature. Like I'm personally scouting the last couple weeks of or the last handful of days in october i've already picked a couple spots out like this i have a spot that's behind a milk barn that's mm-hmm. like a three acre little bedding area where there's it's 200 yards from a parking lot on public i already mm-hmm. have a stand hung for this time frame love it in that area yeah absolutely and that's such a it's such a uh a kind of a funky time but if you get into it one is. of those areas and um and you can make a play or like if a buck's locked down on a doe, you have some time to make a move on that deer. So yeah. don't, yeah. don't rush it. Don't, you know, fly right in there and, and try to make a Superman play, like be methodical yet. And you should get an opportunity to at least close some distance to make something happen. Passive aggressiveness, man. Passive aggressive, <laughs> passive aggressive or passive aggressiveness. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Did I screw that up? <laughs> no, I know what you mean. It just sounded funny. Like just be passive aggressive. <laughs> just give snide yeah. little comments. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, you know. But no, to that point, like um, I know, like the next guy or the next group of guys, kind of up on our docket are um, 
the white tail adrenaline guys like Jared and Tanner. And that's what they're doing. Um, you know, they are, there's times where they're ultra, ultra aggressive using a decoy, doing some different things. And then there's times where they'll sit on a deer and know like they have all day to watch him and kind of methodically figure out how they're going to kill him. And mm-hmm. they don't always kill him, but they get damn close a lot of the times. So yeah. let's, uh, let's cut to that and see what Tanner and Jared have to say about covering ground, calling, and using decoys between the 12th and 17th. Choose a week. When do you think the best time of year to kill a mature buck is? Uh, well, this style, I would have to say probably November 13th through November 17th for lock, fully lockdown phase across the Midwest. You're, I mean, you're targeting I that lockdown. I think that's the peak, and I like peak because then I don't have to piss around. I got stocks. Yeah. You know, if they're a cruise stage, I might not be a good enough hunter when they're cruise stage, but it's hard for me to head them off and kill them, you know, by calling them. He's got short legs. <laughs> well, you, you get my point, you know. But, <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get that, though. Yeah, uh, at least I know when I go then to most of my states that I hunt, it's I, I get locked down bucks and I have fun and I get stocks every day. That's yeah. that's where I'm at with it. Cover ground. And I believe that's the head of all this for the way we do things. And I think that was given from him. You know, I've learned a lot of stuff from many people, but the cover ground in our, even, you know, in, in hunting, I believe it's cover ground. That's, that's it. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have and that to say there's you. a lot of truth to that. You know, that goes right back to what it's I said anything. during lockdown just a minute it's ago. Yeah, yeah, cover ground. You know, I know no, they're in lockdown. Yeah. You get the point. I got to yeah. cover ground, you know. Yeah, yeah, even a tree stand in timber. If I had to use a tree stand, I would still cover ground <laughs> and a shitload on it. You know, I would make sure. Be bopping around, pulling your tree stand in and out. And no, I mean, cover it what? and find number one spot before I hung it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. a lot of people just pick something <clears throat> on an area and go hang it. They wait eight yeah. days and no big buck cruise. There's definitely through. a time and place where it's like if you're a hybrid, <laughs> yeah. you know, you gain a lot by going in on the ground aggressive. Boots and then the it's ground. like, okay, like, especially when you're going into a new area or you haven't been there in a year, yeah. going boots on the ground and after a day or two, it's like, okay, boom, 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 boom. This is where I'd hang the set. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a good hybrid. Yeah. But it starts with the cover ground yeah. thing, I think. Yeah. Especially with on the ground. <laughs> it's very easy to cover ground. You're on the ground. Yeah, you're screw- <laughs> and you're screwing a bunch of stuff up. So you got to keep going back to the next one, next right. one, next yeah. one, next one. Right. Yeah. Those guys make killing deer look easy i mean there's a lot of guys we're talking about here that make it look easy and it's not super easy for most people but um you can't argue their success that it's a little unconventional for most people and like you know it's funny because that's their method and they would look at someone like don higgins like we would never hunt like that and then don higgins looks at someone like that we would never hunt like that but guess what they're both killing big deer so there's yeah. more than one way to do it. Like there's people that would never do, never, ever, ever, ever do what someone else would do and vice versa. And guess what? They both usually kill big deer. So, um, you know, these are hopefully just clips that are going to spark some ideas so you can hone your own personal craft and your own personal style because that's what's that's what's important. Um, okay, so now we have Steve Shirk. So you, you Pennsylvania guys love Steve. We love Steve. He is that guy probably puts in more he's in he's the one percenter of the one percenters of effort and so that's a, that's something very important to consider so it's you know the, when you put when you're the one percenter of the one percenter of effort it once again it's going to look easy when you find success but you're not there walking the hundreds of miles and running the literal hundreds of cameras to try to figure out some of the stuff but here's what he has to say for november 12th to the 17th to hopefully kill a big deer how do you approach hunting the lockdown? I think one of the best ways, especially as a guide that's worked in the past, is it might sound crazy, but maybe put some boots on the ground and look for a hot doe. I've said it before, wherever there's a doe in heat, it's not generally just even one buck on or like there's other satellite bucks circling that area. You may not kill the big, big boy, but there's going to be a lot of activity in a small area. Whenever we find a hot doe, boom, we take advantage of it. And actually, Two of the biggest bucks we got last year was simply because of a hot doe out of the same stand. Guy killed the one in in that stand in the evening. That was probably the dominant buck in the area. Next morning, guess what? There's another one on her. Probably the second dominant buck in that area. I think that's really the biggest key to lockdown is that's exactly what's going on. There's hot does in certain areas. And if you're not where that hot doe is, you're out of the action. So obviously great advice from Steve. The one thing I'd like to add is, you know, 
somebody new coming into this, maybe it's their first or second uh, rut hunting, hunting with a bow or hunting with a gun or whatever the case is. And they're out looking for does, right? But a lot of times, and kind of like similar to the elk woods, I'm going to bring the Western stuff in here. They're looking for one, one doe, right? They're looking for the doe. Mm-hmm. So a couple things to kind of note here is, you know, if you see a doe with young fawns, typically they're, they're, they're probably not the doe that mm-hmm. that buck's going to be inter- interested in. You need to find that one single doe that is more than likely going to be by itself. And that's more than likely. And again, that might be in an obscure area or whatever the case is. But if you're trying to find the hot doe, don't look for the, the doe family groups. Look mm-hmm. for one doe. So That's a great, great piece of advice. And I think that that's through the entire month of November. When you see a doe by yourself, you better just grab your bow and get ready. If you see right. a doe with, with yearlings, you know, maybe a, an immature buck's going to come in and harass the doe. But when you see the lone doe, it's time to get ready because it could happen any second. Um, that's it. Yeah, that's definitely um, very important. And one thing that, uh, just jumping back here too, I remember Cameron and I were talking about this podcast specifically and, and just breaking down you know, this time period. And, and he brought up a good point of when we recorded with Don last summer about hunting the peak of the rut, we asked if you don't know where a deer's at, or like if you don't have a target buck, are you driving around on the seventh or eighth? Or are you going to look for one? And, and I, if my memory serves correctly, he said he's going to be in his best spot in his best tree, period, because of that time frame, And then you have other people that are like, they want to drive around and look and try to find something to make a play on. So I think that's something to keep in the back of your mind. If you're hunting some specific properties and you have that historical spot and you don't have anything to really go off of based off Don's advice, that's what you would do. But maybe if you drew a Kansas tag or you're hunting an area with a lot of uh, access, then you might want to uh, alter that plan a little bit. So that was just one little caveat that I want to bring up. So next we have Tony Peterson. Tony is a, uh, Great storyteller, great host, and also a recent Whitetail Cribs uh, guest as well. And here's what he has to say about this hunkering down and doing what you got to do. So here's what he has to say. Get in all day and you really put in your time. Like, I mean, th- th- I don't think there's any secret to that, right? Like, I think I think what happens when we talk about the rut is we talk about all day sits and we talk about like really the grind and, you know, like we want to sound as badass as possible. The truth is, it's just time in the woods. And so you got to think about that. Okay. Like what if 60% of the bucks are locked down right now at, at any given moment? Well, 40% of them are out there running around, you know? And, and so I, I don't feel, I don't feel that much difference when I'm hunting most of the spots I hunt from like a November 2nd sit versus a November like 15th sit, for example, or what, you know, when they should be cruising chasing versus when they should be locked down. Yeah. I'm never usually not like overrun with them anyway. So it's almost always just a matter of like, how many days can you put in on a funnel or a pinch point you really believe in and do that dark to dark stuff. And, you know, if you believe in a spot and you, it's decent enough, three, four, five, six of those days, somebody's coming through. As long as, you know, as long as the conditions are working for you and the wind doesn't suck and you haven't burned it out. Like, I mean, there's obviously other variables, but it's like, it's time and stand, man. And we, we talk a big game about it. A lot of people do but it's tough. Really, it, it is, it is really tough, but it, that's, that's how you kill him. Like that's, if you want, if you want to have that buck cruise through there, just be there when he goes through. You tend to gravitate more towards pinch points um, and kind of travel or terrain features that are, that are funneling movement during that time. Or have you found yourself gravitating more towards like we'll call just deer bedding areas or doe bedding areas. Uh, I'm all about pinch points and funnels. Yep. Yeah. I don't, I've done you know, my rut strategy. Like if there's a certain situation where I know there's does bedded there and I can get downwind, I might do it, but I'm almost guaranteed to be on some kind of terrain feature anyway. I just, I like, I like finding where deer have to walk and sitting there, you know, like I just, it just works. It works all season long and it works really well during the rut. Now, Tony's a guy that I, I just, the last couple handful of years, I guess, come to know. And I think that he does an excellent job at keeping things simple, like cover the basics. Don't get so obsessed about killing Boone and Crockett deer or 160 or 170. Just get your, if you're a new hunter, just get yourself around deer. Have, get, start having those encounters, start having those experience because that's ultimately is what is going to help create or help mold you into a better hunter. So at times, like I agree with Tony, 
keep it simple, stick to the basics, get yourself around deer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's easier said than done a lot of times. So I just, I, that sounds like an easy task to do, but uh, if you go with that with intensity, you should, you should do that. Um, okay. So next we have Don Higgins, a very similar um, kind of what echoing what we've already discussed, but here's what he has to say, especially during this time period between the 12th and 17th. And something we haven't mentioned through this is depending on where you're at in the country, this you're probably experiencing some level of lockdown at some point in this. It might be the 13th, 14th, might be the 12th or 13th, might be, you know, depending on where you're at, this might be different by a day or two. So that's where I think the, the Rod White, the Jared and Tanner strategies of just finding that lockdown dough with the buck. That's that strategy. But here's what Don has to say about this specific time period. What about during that lockdown phase of let's say the ninth and 11, 12, maybe it's different in every area in different pockets, but are you going and trying to find a big buck that's locked on a dough if you don't know of anything? Um, I have. Uh, so you can really break down November into about three segments. You got that first week, you know, through the seventh or eighth or so where the bucks are cruising, looking for does hard. Then you got like the middle two weeks. Most mature bucks are, are going to spend most of that period locked down with a doe. It, it's going to be, if they're not, it's going to be a very brief period when they're between hot does. And, and that's the toughest period of the of the whole season to hunt, I think, because you don't know where that deer is going to be with that doe. I, I've actually got stands set in, in places that I don't hunt at any other time except during that lockdown phase. And what I've noticed is that these mature bucks have a tendency to run these does out into the same areas year after year. It might be a drainage ditch out in the middle of a farm field or a fence row out in the middle of nowhere. And it's a place where you would hardly ever see a deer. But during that lockdown phase, there's just a really good chance that a mature buck is going to have a doe out there. Now, your odds of being there on the same day that they are is not really good, but it's the best chance you got. How mentally challenging is it for you to hunt the lockdown of the rut? Because you, you're just coming off this craziness. It's right there on the top of your mind. You remember it because it was just a couple of days ago. And now you're like, you just hear the birds chirping and you hear the squirrel running around, the woodpecker hitting the tree. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's tough, man. I, I mean, I, I, we've all been there, right? It's like, you feel like you're the only person on earth that has not killed a giant yeah, buck. Like you're right. scrolling through social media, <laughs> you get all the texts from your buddies, and it's like, am I the worst deer hunter in the world? No, you're not the worst deer hunter in the world. I promise you that. Um, you just gotta, you know, stay positive and know, like, hey, there still is some time left, and I'm gonna have to wait another 12 months for this. So just stay positive and and keep going at it with the, some the same tenacious work ethic and fortitude that you did on November 2nd, November 3rd, November 4th. Ab absolutely. So here's what Steve Hansen has to say. So we're just talking about the lockdown. And guess what? When lockdown is over and those bucks get done breeding those does, guess what they're going to do? Here's what he has to say. What about hunting the lockdown phase of the ride? I mean, if someone's out here or they are, let's say they're in Kansas or maybe Illinois or Wisconsin right. or wherever they're at for the this November, what is a viable lockdown strategy? You know, the, the only the only successful tactic for lockdown is just to grind it out kind of hunting as close as you can to bedding cover mm -hmm. you know try to get in somewhere pretty close to bedding areas hoping a few does just takes one doe. just tapes one doe and you know just be in there and then it's just a patience game for mm -hmm. sure so yeah because you want to be there when it breaks too yeah you know what i mean we were it's just talking not, about how you talk to different people and yep. it's one one part yep. is like oh my gosh it's on fire and yep. so you guys aren't seeing anything and then it's like a day lag yeah like it wouldn't surprise me at all for like where that decatur county yeah. farm is their rut comes in a day sooner or a day later than the peak you know then things really start happening here i mean that happens every year for us so there is something to it i don't you know i don't know what exactly triggers it one place over another but it does so uh, yeah i would say uh stay in touch with people in the general vicinity and area. Yeah. I think and anymore, awesome. it's never been easier. You know, with Instagram. Oh yeah. yeah. You know I what mean, I mean? You, you, you just, up, there's 17 new. Giant exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, up oh, that it's yeah. on, it's on in Illinois or it's on in Iowa. I was talking to Steve about this the last time I was out there and I asked him, you know, what's the lockdown like? So they have quite a few hunters in camp typically. And he said, it's very apparent. You know, you go from guys seeing a lot of bucks and a lot of activity. And then there's about two days where it's not. And then boom, it busts loose again. So that's the importance of this of, okay. So if it's on lockdown, try to find that hot dough, try to find that activity going on during that period. But then just know that 
it's going to turn back on. It might not be to the same level of intensity on the front end of this, but on this now back end of it, like there's still, still very good hunting. And that's where a lot of these guys, they love this time period because those bucks are getting more desperate. No, that's a, that's a, a, a great tidbit of advice. Like if you see that little bit of rut frenzy, you know, three days prior, and then you go a couple days that it is stone cold be, be in, be there when it breaks, man, be there when it breaks on that third day or that fourth day. Like, you know, it, at some point they're going to cut loose. Um, well, the other thing is obviously watch, be watching your cell cameras too. Like, yeah. you know, that's, that's a, I mean, again, pretty common sense, but just got to put it out there. Rook, Rook, how much, you know, there's a, there's this movement now where it's like dis- people like cameras are important and they tell you a lot of information, but there's a lot of just like, don't believe what your cameras say. Where do you fall on that? I think, no, they're a valuable asset. I just don't think that you get, become totally dependent on, which I've been guilty of in the past. Mm-hmm. Like you still I think have everyone thinking, has. Yeah. Yeah. You have to still be thinking about what they're telling you. It's a snapshot in time, right? Like just because you mm-hmm. get a picture of a deer, even if it's on a cell camera, doesn't mean you're going to go out and kill that, kill that buck. But if you know the area and you know where that camera is and you see the direction of travel or you have a video or whatever the case is, like, Use the information in an overview. Like you have one Absolutely. little piece. Look at the overview and try to figure out, okay, where, what the heck is going on in this exact situation? Like what, what piece of information is the, is the picture or video telling me? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's so important to ask yourself, where is he going to go bed? Did he look like he was cruising hard? Was his tongue hanging out in the picture? And, you know, it's like there's a lot of things you really have to try to deduct from a picture. So, okay, so now we have – the next part so we'll call this the post rut and this kind of whole period depending on like here in illinois the i believe the 17th is opening day of shotgun season so like the party is kind of over with all the influx of pressure and then indiana i think their gun season or rifle season is probably around that same time period ohio you still guys you guys still have true post rut archery bow hunting we have the youth season that that pops in we have the youth season that pops in for two or three days but for the for the most part yes Okay. And so this is very dependent on that in my mind. And this is just my experience. If you can find an area that didn't have a lot of gun pressure, then I think this, some of these core principles will apply uh, for sure. And so, but if you're in an area where there's really high gun pressure, you might want to have, you might have to relocate and try to go find an area that there wasn't a lot of gun pressure. So um, here's what John Eberhart, we love John. He's been on the podcast a bunch. He is, uh, you know, once again, there's a million ways to kill big deer and he has his way. And, you know, whether, whether you believe everything like from like, I'll just say how it is. And I, I would say this to John too. It's like, he believes in scent lock. Okay. That's excellent. He has a, an incredible track record, but even if you're not believing that, like look at his strategy, <laughs> like he's still getting in bow range of these deer in a very specific fashion. And here's what he has to say about hunting. We'll call it the post rut. And uh, here's what he has to say. So one thing that I picked up on from a previous conversation with you was that when you're hunting out of state, a lot of times you're running cameras on scrape, primary scrape Mm -hmm. areas. And also, when you're going to hunt those times, it's usually later in the year. Like in Kansas this year, you're going November 16th. Right. Thanksgiving is when it gets good. So when usually everyone talks about scrapes, they're talking October 22nd to the 1st of November. Mm -hmm. When do you see those scrapes start to turn back on, and why do you think that is? Okay, that's a very good question, and I've got a really good answer (laughs) for you. (laughs) Because early... A pre-rut, there's a pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut. Once the peak rut gets there, most of your big bucks, even out there, even when we're in Kansas, I'm talking the 150s and bigger, they're doed up. They, you hardly ever see them. They push does into bedding areas and they don't come out during the daytime. So you'll see 125, 30, maybe a 140 incher, but you're not seeing the big, big ones. So once it gets about the 23rd, 24th, it's almost to the day, 23rd, 24th of November, that's when you start seeing those big bucks because now the majority of the does in the area are bred and now he has to go out just like he did during pre-rut. He has to go out post-rut. His testosterone is still high. He has to go out and physically search now for those late estrus does. So they're not as, they're not as frequent as they are during the peak rut. And during peak rut, you know, once he finishes one cycle, he can just go take over the next one. Even if she's with another buck, the dominant one will take her over and push her into a bedding area and breed her. So mm-hmm. post rut is every bit as good as the pre rut. I think it's actually a little bit better because the, they're a little bit more worn down. Their eyes are drawn. Um, I, they they just come through with reckless abandon. 
like I was mentioning with that 180 incher we talked about. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I, I, I think after the 23rd or 24th in the Midwest, post rut, if you're hunting in a state where the gun season doesn't open until December, I think that post rut is absolutely the best time to kill a big buck. You know, I think John's an outstanding individual. I talk to him on a semi-regular basis. And I think the problem that people have with John is they can't get past, at times he can come off cocky. That's not John. Like he not at all. He's not that guy at all. But people have a hard time getting past the set, the, you know, the, his set control regimen. But like John is a freaking outstanding deer hunter. There's a lot of guys that follow his regimen that don't kill the deer that John kills. And like, whether you're with the scent thing or not, like to your point that you said prior to the clip, listen to how he's breaking down the areas and his strategy around the way that he's hunting, regardless if you're a believer or not in the, you know, in the, in the suit or the scent control stuff, like he's still doing a whole lot of stuff, right? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Simply put, simply put. So, um, you know, we have a lot of clips to pull from Steve because we have a specific pod- podcast that was released earlier this month on hunting basically an entire month of November. And so here's what he has to say. If you still have that tag in your pocket and you're still trying to ch- chase down a buck, this is, this is, uh, this boiling it down to the most basic level. This is how he's going to do it. It's, uh, it's November 15th. Okay. You still haven't filled your tag. Right. Should you be nervous? For me, I would say no, no, because you're getting into some of the days that I like the very best. 15th, that time's pretty good, but we get, you get around that 18th, 19th, right up until about Thanksgiving. Those are really good days. And 90% of the opportunities we get at that time are in the evenings on food sources. Mm. And it's like those, those more mature bucks as a number of does that have been, that haven't been bred whittles, you know, whittles down. They're coming to that as much for food as they are to keep checking new does. And, uh, we had a really amazing night. Um, it's been years ago, I think it was 2010 or something, but we only had a couple guys hunting. They were, were people we'd told to come back because they'd had tougher hunts in the main part of the rut. So they were here in that, I think it was the 18th or 19th or sometime right around there. And we were also hunting for ourselves and we shot, I shot the 198. One of the other hunters shot a 176 and a 167. So there's five guys out that night and we shot the, we, three and giants. we got all three of them. Yeah. That was the amazing thing. Yeah. You know, what was the food source you guys were on then? Um, I was in, on a cornfield, corn food plot. One guy was on a, and two of the other guys were on Nebraska plots. Really? Yep. Yep. And the ge- geographically we were in, two separate counties, but probably from north to south, we're probably 50 miles apart. Oh, so, so not even the same neighborhood. We weren't even the same neighborhood or same thing, but it was like your perfect day where, you know, in the morning it was 55 degrees and by seven o'clock that night it was 22. Ooh, yeah. So it was a, it was a, you know, high pressure cold front. It was the classic day. Yeah. So what's your, what's your personal favorite late November food source? If you had a, if you had a pin one, I would say grains. So even more linear, uh, corn or beans. Corn, corn, <laughs> corn. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, corn. And I'll be honest, like I have always gotten my butt kicked in this in this time frame. I've never, mm-hmm. never, ever, ever found success. And I think for me personally, a lot of times it's like almost recovery mode. Like, sure. <laughs> well, okay, gotta- we run a you know a, a e-commerce brand, a product company. Guess what is during this period? It's a little <laughs> thing called Black Friday. You may have heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard of it. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It's uh for me, it's like, okay, let's focus back on the business, get things taken care of because you've trying to play catch up maybe for the last couple of weeks. And yeah, it's just kind of a recalibrate time for me personally. It's just the way it's always been. Yeah, I fall into the same thing. A lot of the stuff I pushed off on everything is like, okay, I have to come back to reality, unfortunately or fortunately. Um, but depending on, you know, the uh, right during this period, it's Thanksgiving, maybe you get some time off. And maybe you still have a buck tag in your pocket. There's a lot of guys that have really good success. And I think this clip from Don's going to illustrate that specifically. What about on when you're hunting almost every day in the month of November on some of those, we're bound to at least get one really warm spell in November at some point. Uh-huh. Are those kind of throwaway hunts for you or are those observation or are you still? Um, it, it just depends on, on what stands i've got available and where these bucks where my target buck is um sometimes that's a good day to sleep in catch up on your rest and Mm -hmm. save yourself for those days when everything's right instead of getting burnt out i think there's a lot of deer hunters that get burnt out um 
before the rut's over. Um, the end of the rut, Thanksgiving weekend, is a fantastic time to kill a giant, but most bow hunters are burned out before Thanksgiving. Yeah. So you, you got to kind of play the long game again and don't burn yourself out. If it, if the weather's hot, stay home, sleep in that day, and save yourself for later in the month. Mm-hmm. What makes that Thanksgiving time frame so special for killing a giant? Well, the, this this tip came from Roger Rothar, too, and when I was maybe 19, 20 years old. Um, he, he talked about how great Thanksgiving weekend was. And, and if you think about the rut during that, the middle two weeks of November, there's hot does available to a buck almost constantly. Uh, he gets done with one hot doe. It, it doesn't take you very long at all until he finds the next one. But as you start winding down towards the end of November, those, um, hot does are harder to come by. So a buck is spending more time between hot does on the search. And around Thanksgiving, you know, those he may spend two days searching between hot does. And when he is, he's on his feet a lot. He knows it's about over for the year. And he's desperately searching for that last hot doe. And there was a period about 20 years ago, maybe 25, where for five consecutive seasons, the best buck I seen from a tree stand, each of those five seasons, was during Thanksgiving weekend. What do you what do you think about that Thanksgiving time frame? Because like I said, it, it's there's this we're all hunting whitetails, and the whitetail does not evolve as fast as our tactics do on on what we say <laughs> changes. Like you know they've been evolving for however many thousands of years, and then we're you know every year like well this is what worked this year. And uh, but anyways, it's uh like I said this Thanksgiving time frame I think is continuing to gain popularity for guys that still have their their tags in their pocket as those bucks become desperate. Um, yeah, but I think the important thing is just if you if you just pounded your farm for the last thirty days, you know, r- naturally run a lot of cameras in those neighborhoods where it has been hunted really hard. I just haven't seen that. Um, but there's areas and friends that I know that are in different pockets, and it's an excellent time frame. So I think that's the key takeaway of finding a pocket that hasn't just been hunted really hard for the last twenty days, twenty five days, or thirty days. I'll say, you know. When I was like strictly the big woods guy, that handful of years where we mm-hmm. were hunting um, hill country, big woods style stuff, this time frame is where we would see more new bucks show up in the daylight than any other time of the year. Just so like, I'm, a, I'm not going to say it was a random buck, but a buck that maybe we had maybe one or two pictures of throughout the year and then like completely gone. This is the time where we would find them on a scrape or we'd find them in some type of uh, – some type of travel corridor or, or, or pinch point that, mm-hmm. but again, never had success catching up with them because it was, I'm going to say 90% of the time, whether it was camera placement or, or whatever the case was, you got one or two pictures of him. So it's it tough. is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Really tough. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, is there any, <clears throat> I mean, I think there's some other key things to consider. I mean, we can't predict what the weather's going to be doing through the bulk of November, but um, even thinking of last year, I mean, you were out in Iowa and it was really warm. What was your experience then? Uh, well, I was, like it is what it is it's a different it's a different world like we saw buck movement movement it late in the mornings like on those hot days obviously it did die down um kind of during the afternoon time frame but then it picked right back up to uh in the evening time so even when the weather was bad in iowa it was still a better rut than some of the good ruts that i can remember here in ohio just from a pure deer density standpoint a lot of competition a lot of deer moving around so i mean yeah, that that was my experience in Iowa with uh, with warm weather. Yeah, well, I, and I could t- there was a stretch when it was really hot. I was just in the pocket where there was a hot doe, and so that was I was on them then. But a lot of friends were just like, "Man, this is really slow. This sucks." But I will say, when that front rolled in, the I think it was the twelfth or the eleventh last year, and that was where there was like a light switch that came off. So if you were someone that you're moving around your vacation times and it feels sacrilege to not be out, but you have very limited time, my gut feeling says try to time it with weather if as much as you can. I know that's not possible for everyone, but I think you you'll thank yourself. Now, could it get yes, it could definitely happen when it's hot and there's going to be big deer that get killed when it's hot. But if you're just simply stacking your odds, that's my just personal opinion on it. Yeah. Again, let's go back to the basics on this and deer are going to breed regardless of what the weather is. Maybe that activity comes at night because of the weather, but like the rut's the rut. It's going to happen the same time, same, like, it, it is what it is. Like, I think that we've finally, as a, a deer hunting culture or society, we've finally gotten away from 
some of the moon stuff, the full, like the moon phase. The full <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, I, I, I think over the last handful of years, like we're getting to the place where people realize like there's, that doesn't happen. And like, okay, when you yeah, look yeah. at the, when you look at the, um, uh, gestation period and like when those fawns are dropping, we talk about that in the spring, like all of that stuff, there's just too much evidence to, to say otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, for anyone that wants to hone in more about November, I mean, we have a full catalog on the Exodus podcast, our YouTube channel that shares so much of this. I mean, we have Dr. Bronson Strickland talking about the same thing you just mentioned. And if you are a moon guy, we have people like Ryan Springer that that's going to share how he, how he gets it done in association with that. And, um, there's just a lot of information, but just try to keep it as simple as possible. Keep to the basics. And, and it was funny because I, as I was getting ready to leave for a couple of weeks, I was recording a lot of these November episodes and, unprovoked all these really successful white tail hunters there was one common theme of all of them and they all had a different synonym for it grit tenacity <laughs> mental toughness okay so it's like i'm trying to get tactics to share to our listeners here but that was i mean that was really what it was it was those words right there so grit tenacity sticking with it and so we can give you all this information but a lot of this whether we want to admit it or not comes from within it comes in between your two ears of whether you get it done or not that's it's simple and maybe maybe that's hard because people don't want to accept responsibility when you look at the end of November and it didn't go the way you wanted. I hate to say it, you know, there's going to be hunts that are going to get ruined. There's going to be stuff that happens that you didn't expect, but that happens for everyone, everyone, right. every single person. So you just have to remember that you're not on a unique island here. Well, we all have the same things here. So uh, any other parting pieces thing? Any other parting pieces of advice for November? No, I think just you know. Follow your gut to a, to a certain point. And like, if you don't have conviction in what you're doing, do something else and, and don't be afraid. I know that we've talked about like time and stand and grit and tenacity and stuff, but dude, if you're not in the right spot, don't be afraid to get down and move and scout and do what you need to do to get yourself in a position where your gut feels good, man. Yeah, definitely. Pay attention to that was another thing that Rod, uh, Rod White mentioned. He said, one of the biggest pieces of advice is keep the phone in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> very simple very simple just keep oh, your phone like in your pocket not, and pay attention not playing games or yeah yeah, oh, yeah pay attention stay off dude, instagram and just you're there to hunt that's that's it dude and like this is going to be a cliche saying but literally it takes five seconds and it goes from the worst season to your best season ever like literally five seconds so yeah dude you're it's i know it's intense because you're on edge you're like you're expecting stuff to happen but uh, keep the phone in the pocket man yeah, definitely. Well, I hope this helps one person. I hope this helps one person, hopefully more, but one person kill their best deer of all time. That's, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like we have a lot of new listeners and I think sometimes people, well, who, who are these guys and what do they do? And I'm not really sure, but I, you know, they came across my feed on iTunes and, um, like we, we run a trail camera and arrow company. Like that's what we do. That's why we have this. But beyond that, it's just to simply help educate people, make the experience better, and if you want to invest in our products and, and see why we're in business and see why we believe quality products sh- shouldn't cost a fortune, we would love that. And you can do that at exodusoutdoorgear.com. But it's simply, we're just here to, we love this as much as anyone else. And we're just here to share information. That's it, man. It's our passion and we're lucky enough to live it. Absolutely. What's the, what, you know, this is, we, ha- we really don't say this phrase as much as maybe we should. <laughs> Life's a passion, pursue it. Right now is November. Go pursue your passion because it'll be over here real soon. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>